It's like having one window in a house. Um, and let's, for sake of argument, call this window the Enron window. <laughs> so if somebody throws a rock at this window, at the Enron window, how much of the window do you have to replace? Let's say you only buy one share, right, of, of this um, stock. You put in $100 into a unit, a mutual fund unit, you're actually buying maybe two of these stocks and four of these and one-tenth of this one. And so it, it doesn't even necessarily have to be a complete share. It's a, it's a collection of company stocks, many, many, many companies. Now in this case, if you happen to have an Enron window in there and that window goes out, it doesn't take out your entire window. It only takes out one pane of the window, right? So um, when you purchase stock, you're working through a stock broker um, or an online trading system and you pay a fee. If you want advice, you go through a broker and they'll charge a fee as well to help you decide what those are. When you buy units, uh, there's somebody called a professional money manager uh, and they're getting paid a fee to manage um, what stocks are purchased in here. And one of the ways you can remember what a mutual fund is a mutual fund is that many uh, thousands of people are mutually agreeing to fund this investment, right? And so that's, that's where you get the term mutual fund. Um, and so what happens uh, is you don't know what all these stocks are doing at any particular time. You don't have a crystal ball. So the idea is, um, you know, the question then comes about at some point, is it okay for, um, is it okay for somebody just to buy once a year? Um, and that concern then comes around and somebody goes, well, let's do math. And then they, they come to a conclusion and they say, well, let me show you why it's not a good idea to buy once a year. So the reason I had to explain the units and the shares is to, is to really understand dollar cost averaging. You have to understand what a unit is. So let's say at peak, the unit price, based on the value of this unit, let's say the unit price is $100. But then somewhere in here, as the market comes down, the unit price will also come down, and let's say it's $50. And when the market really tanks, the unit price can come down even further, and let's say the unit price is $25. So as the market changes, the cost of a unit will also change. Y'all with me? Mm -hmm. And that's because the underlying stocks are at a discount. And so as these things fluctuate, that changes. Well, if you only buy, uh, and let's say your investment is, I'm putting in, you know, a uh, uh, $100, right? We'll keep it simple, $100 a year. You put in $100, how many units did you buy if you put in once a year at that point, how many units did you buy? What? You only purchased one unit for your $100, right? But what if instead of doing that, you purchased multiple times throughout the year? And so you had a systematic approach to doing it every single month, right? And so what happens is, you divide up that investment over a period of time and you're going to buy, you know, one unit here, but you would buy two units here and you would buy how many here? Four. 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 So at the end of a year, instead of having one unit, you would have multiple units, right? And so over time, the reason this is valuable is you purchased all these units down here. Well, over time, the units that you bought at the very lowest point that were once worth $25, now are worth what? $150. 
that's where you really get the substantial amount of growth is when you buy something at a depreciated value, at a lower value, that then appreciates over time, right? So if I bought a unit at $25 uh, because it just happened to be a downturn, and so that month I picked up four units instead of one, well, later on down the road, that's where I really make my money. You aren't making great strides with your account balance when you purchase at the high point. You're making great strides when you purchase at the low point. The irony behind that is what most people do when it comes to their finances is when the market's down, they panic and they stop investing. Mm -hmm. The irony behind that is what? It's on sale. It's on sale. Also, Red tag. Also, dude, if you think that you can pin the bottom of the market, you probably couldn't. You'd probably buy and keep going down. Yeah, it's not even it's not even whether you think you can. You can't. Mathematically, uh, historically, there are people who do this for decades and cannot pinpoint the bottom side of the market. If that were the case, then you know somebody would monopolize the entire industry and all the rest of us. They would be the god of our world, and we would just be their peasants, you know. Uh, and so, this is not. It's not possible to time the market. There are too many variables. And it's, and it's even gotten more complicated uh, in the last several years due to our, global, our economy becoming global. Now there are uh, so many other factors involved. So the bottom line is, at the end of the day, you purchase more value. Now, I've now explained this to you from a financial sort of mathematical perspective. And on some levels, there's probably a few people in here that are confused. Uh, it's okay. Um, some of these things take a little time to kind of wrap your head around. But let me give you some practical. Amy talked about uh, how uh, I might be good at explaining things in the, that are complicated in a simple way. So let me tell you, uh, I might still explain this to somebody. But more often than not, what I'm going to say to a client is I probably won't go through this. What I'll probably do is to tell you, now that you know the principle, I'll say to a client, they say, uh, well, isn't it better if I just wait until the end of the year, save as much as I can, and then I'll dump it all in at once? And I'll say, well, what if, what if you decided to only buy groceries once a year? What are the chances that you would get what you want and get it on sale? That hits home with somebody a little bit more Versus if you went to the grocery store once a week, you know, I just went to Costco uh, Friday, yesterday. It's always a dangerous thing to do. Um, and, uh, and as I was going throughout the store, um, I always, you know, I have a list of things that I need, right? Well, I go through there and I go, okay, it's time to buy this. I'm, gonna get, I'm getting this on sale, right? So if I just go once a year, I'm not, I don't have a very good likelihood at all of catching what I need on sale, right? But if I go consistently, some weeks I'll go, you know what, I really don't have to have that right now because I'm not, I'm not really out of that and it's, and it's not on sale. Have you ever done that before? Mm -hmm. Versus you go down to the next aisle and you go, you know what, I'm close to being out of that, it's on sale, so what? Let's get it now. Let's get it now, right? And, and I'll even buy some extra and store those so that, I, right? This yeah. is how it works. Well, the same thing applies with the marketplace, right? So that's one way to explain it. Here's another way to explain it. How many of you have ever played Monopoly before? <laughs> Who wins the game of Monopoly? The person that waits to only buy Boardwalk and Park Place? Or the, per or the person that purchases everything they land on no matter what they land on? Who wins? The, the person with the most properties, Baltic Place, is worth something because what I paid for it was dramatically discounted, right? It was cheap, but I'm buying all along the way no matter what I do. Mathematically, the game of Monopoly is really based on dollar cost averaging. It's the same principle. And if you think you can time it, you have a big issue because you have to time the rolling of the dice landing on that specific space against also all these other players that are also trying to do it and then you have to get both of them before three other people get one of them right there's all these variables 
you won't win the game of finance by trying to only purchase park place and boardwalk. That sounds a lot about like a uh, sequence of risk too, and when you retire in a way. Yeah. Does that help, Those, that monopoly example? Oh, that's really good. good. Yeah. So, uh, so when, you're, when your mind gets infested with the financial industry <laughs> to the degree that mine is, you can't really do anything normally without relating it to what you do. So I'm playing a game and I go, oh. You know, it gets to the point where some people around you are like, okay, enough. <laughs> uh, and, you know, to them, whatever. Uh, they're either reaping the benefits of your obsession uh, or they wish they had. So, uh, you know, you've got to, the reality is these are principles based on math. Uh, there's no question that this is the better way to do it. Um, it's just like um, when I was in Costco um, yesterday, I ended up buying several Christmas items. Um, I didn't go to Costco to do Christmas shopping, but as I walked down the aisle, I said, oh, that's one of the items on my list, and so I'm going to purchase it now. And so I benefited from, you know, going there a couple of weeks or whatever and finding something that I need, right? Don't go there every day. Bad idea. <laughs> You'll spend more than you want. Too bad they aren't just all investments. <laughs> that's right. That's right. It's none of them are. Uh, <laughs> but investments um, into happiness. Yeah, maybe. Aww. Um. So, so that's dollar cost average. Any questions on that? Yeah, I got a comment I'd like to make. Um, there's even some accounts, and I do this on my accounts that I have that will allow me to do this. You can dollar cost average every week. So if you have like a Trans One account or if you have a Trans Alpha account, I just make a deposit every week and I just set mine up to drip out some, you know, minor number that wouldn't affect me financially. Yeah. Every week it just goes in and dollar cost average every week, you know. Yeah, yeah. 50 bucks or 100 bucks or whatever you think yeah. you can handle. It's just cool stuff. Yeah, it's very cool. Um, it used to be that um, this wasn't even available on, a, on uh, our IEO platform. And then I was on the advisory council to Transamerica, and uh, I was in the big in their board meeting, and uh, and I said we need to add dollar cost averaging to the IUL, and um, literally uh, the room was hushed. You had to be there. I wish I would have had this whole thing recorded. The room was hushed. You're talking about. I'm sitting there with 10 of the most successful people in our company nationwide, and I'm sitting next to the president of underwriting. Uh, two, two other seats down is the uh, chief marketing officer of our company, and then two seats down from them is the president of our securities broker dealer. I mean, it just goes on and on. It just, this room is stacked. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, we need to have uh, dollar cost averaging available in the Transamerica IUL. And it was just silence. <laughs> and then the, the chief marketing officer stands up and goes, literally stands up and goes, what do you mean? <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? I looked what around like mean? puzzled, like, <laughs> what do you mean, what do I mean? <laughs> And literally, the room was silent, and people were looking at me baffled. The reason why is, is even something that simple, they had overlooked it because they, they thought with the guaranteed floor that you have on an IUL, they thought you're not able to really maximize by buying low necessarily, and there's no loss potential. So it's just locked in and, and always, you know, increasing. What they missed was when you purchase an IUL, this is a little more advanced for the last couple minutes, but for those that have been around a while, when you buy an IUL, you have 12 buckets, right? You have one for each segment, or, or if you want to look at it this way, one for each month. So you have 12 buckets that money's going into in terms of your IUL. It's not like a traditional mutual fund where all of your money is going into the same bucket, the same pool of cash, and then it's going up and down. What's happening is, you're, is one bucket's here, the other bucket's here, 
right, throughout the year, these buckets are also placed at different positions depending on the calendar uh, event of your application. Now, the new people with me, you're lost. It's okay. I'm talking advanced concept for a second for those that have been around a while. Um, so, uh, they're trying to wrap their head around why does this matter? Well, it's simple. If you have a client who 1035's money in, and I, I've had a client 1035 in $300,000 before into a life insurance contract. Well, what if they just so happen to 1035 that money in uh, here? Now they have a massive amount of money in at a high point, right? This is going to be a problem for accumulation over time. Because what they're going to do is they're going to mark the, the market value at this point, and then <clears throat> down the road a year from now, is the market higher or lower, and that's going to determine how much interest you get in there. You with me? So if the market happens to not hit that higher than that peak, my client's going to be pissed. Yeah. They're not going to earn any interest. So I, I was actually explaining this to this room. <laughs> and I said, we need to be able to have a feature to where if somebody lumps in money once a year, or they lump in bigger times other than others, or they 1035 money in, we can then have it automatically be dumping into these other buckets periodically so that we're buying it at different points in the market. At that point that I said that, the president of the securities thing literally stands up at his desk, throws his pen in the middle, and goes, you are now the VIP of this meeting, <laughs> and how come none of us thought of this before? And I'm sitting there like, yeah, you're dumb. <laughs> like, this seems simple. Uh, now the problem is what? The problem is they don't do this for a living in the real world. They do it in front of a screen, hypothetically for others, right? So the place you, you know. Last thing I'll finish with, it's ironic that I, Michael, high school diploma, high school diploma, maybe even not parade-worthy high school diploma, <laughs> just high school diploma, uh, and sitting in that room advising a $750 billion company. It's a power, this is the biggest message I want to send you today. It's the power of experience and in-field application. It's the power of real life work. You can do all you want to study and get degrees and masters and all these other things. I will run circles around you because I actually do this with real people in real life for 20 years, right? So those of you that are in this room, you're not going to, I didn't gain the knowledge I shared with you today out of a book. And the thing I talked to you about, what was the most impactful? It was the practical, simple, real life explanation. When I did the grocery store shopping on sale, you're all looking at me like, wow, that's awesome. <laughs> when I was explaining the first one, you were looking at me like, glazed over, I'm about to slip into a coma. When I gave the grocery store example, you're sitting forward and you're like, ah, I'm smiling and into it. And then when I shared the Monopoly one, you were like, this is awesome. <laughs> so, right? and then, and then the dude, the dude who has the least educational background in the room, is the VIP of the meeting, right? It's because you're going to gain more by just going out in the field today, taking a field trainer with you, going to see real families, do the real business. You'll learn a thousand more times in the matchup in the field seeing people than you will in the office at a, at a classroom. Does that make sense? Yep. All right. Thanks, everybody. Cool. Thanks. Uh,